Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, uh, with my daughter co-hosting today. I'll have her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Rebecca Horsley Barra, and I am sitting in today for my sister, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Rebecca, we've got a really interesting show today because we're going to talk about how grief can impact the marriage. And we have a great author on today. And uh, why don't you introduce her? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, I'd like to introduce you today to Sherry Cassidy. Sherry is a prominent family lawyer, mediator, and private judge in Palo Alto, California. She also teaches on marriage and divorce topics and is the author of a new book, Marriage Unveiled, The Promise, Passion, and Pitfalls of Imperfectly Ever After. Welcome to our show, Sherry. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Gloria. So great to have you on the show today. And I know um, I've read a copy of your book and everybody should have this book, honestly. Uh, your wisdom and knowledge of marriage and using your own marriage uh, to tell this story about, about all our marriages and about how marriage goes. I really felt that you wanted to let the people know who you work with, what it's like and you know to have faith still mm -hmm. in the marriage process. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it is a process and that's something that um, we don't really talk about in the culture. It's kind of like, it's the static happily ever after you find the right person. And then it's all just, you know, roses and champagne. <laughs> and, and so uh, unfortunately what I've seen over my career working with divorcing and separating couples is that that mythology really gets in the way of of reality and doing the work. And so the imperfectly ever after is really an important piece to share. And I did feel that it was important to share through my own story, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just like the work that you're doing with grief and bringing on so many of your guests who have been through it personally, because in hearing someone's personal story, we respect that that's their story but it also resonates and it's very grounded um, in the reality. And that's what I wanted to bring to the marriage discussion and kind of open up the conversation. For benefit of our audience specifically, you had a personal experience yourself. Your son, Timothy in 2010 uh, was skateboarding and had a skateboarding accident. Yeah. Went off the skateboard, hit his head and never recovered. But I also want to tell our audience it's a very special day today because it's the 12th anniversary of your loss of Timothy. Right. Anyway. And that was pure coincidence to the extent we have coincidence or synchronicity. So it feels um, like a special day to be with you and to share about Timothy and about couple grief. Right. Yeah. And you talk a little bit about in writing the book, you weren't going to talk about this, right? I, I wasn't, you know, so I, I have been really writing this marriage book for many, many years, probably at least 30 years mm -hmm. of, of practicing and seeing marriages falling apart, practicing in my own marriage. And I finally got serious about writing it in about 2009. And then in 2010, Timmy died. And I'm mm -hmm. in the middle of like this serious endeavor to write a book about marriage. And we lost our son and I just felt like, how can I write about marriage when this huge event, you know, heartquake just happened. So, so I shelved the marriage project for some time and I came back to it a few years ago. I would say it's been um, about a three-year process. So a process of really pulling all of my writing together and creating what I thought was the book and then starting to send it out to people and do editing. And that was a that's been another whole two years of the refining and editing and input. And in that process, you know, my first draft of the book, literally Timmy was a footnote. That was our 30th year okay. of marriage. And uh, 
at that time, our children were 30, 35, and 20. So Timmy mm -hmm. was 20 when he passed. So um, people were like, well, you've got to talk about that. You can't just you can't just say that and leave it there. You've got to say more. So then I added a little more context and a little more context. And the more I added, the more people said, this is something that couples really need to hear about. And certainly couples who have lost children are hungry to hear about your experience. So it grew and grew into a, a full chapter, um, a, but still trying to focus very much on the dynamic of the marriage because grief is, you know, as you know, it's such a huge topic and a huge experience and event. Um, the, uh, clearly, you could write a whole book on individual grief. You could write a whole book on right. marital grief. So trying to, to look at some of the interactions that we had as a married couple and that we had as a family following Timmy's death um, that I think would be, you know, instructive and helpful for for other people navigating this really terrible terrain. You know, I've heard statistics that um, over 50% of marriages don't last after the death of a child. And then I heard another statistic saying, well, 50% of marriages don't last in the world. So, right. so I'd love to hear more on that. Right, so there's, there's one study that was done about marriage uh, survival after the death of a child. And I think that the result of that study, which was a very small sample, um, was that 80% of the marriages fell apart or separated. So in some ways that's not too surprising. If 50% of marriages are separating, then you put this cataclysmic event in there and um, yeah, another whole percentage is going to blow apart, but I'm not sure that that's a, an accurate statistic, yeah, but we I, know anecdotally how hard it is for couples to survive the death of a child. Uh, Compassionate Friends actually did a study and found that like 27% or something, much less, much less. It was only a survey and, you know, there needs to be more study on this. There's so many variables connected, but I find that couples right. are so frightened and, and they have therapists saying to them, you've got to watch your marriage now and you've got enough problems without right. being afraid that you're going to get divorced. And, you know, it's a shaky time, but right. there's one thing about it. I always say only you two know the same grief. There's this intense bond that nobody else really knows as closely what you're going through as the other parent. Um, and at the same time, every time you look at that person, it's maybe a trigger, it's maybe a mirror, it's maybe a consolation, but there's that dynamic that the grief is always kind of present in the conversation, in the relationship. And then depending, you know, on where you are in your relationship at that point in time, because part of, you know, what we know about marriage is it changes all the time. So you may be in a really stable place with a lot of contentment and compatibility. You may be in a really rocky place to begin with. There may be complications of blame or responsibility that I think you'll have all really that. Difficult. I think you'll have all the blame and responsibility going on between you. And yeah. it's also you should grieve like me, you know, yes, right. you should be doing this, you should be doing that, or, you know, one way or the other. So it, it right. is a hard time for couples. But I just want everybody to who's watching this or listening, hey, guess what, Sherry and I both got through yeah. with our marriages intact. Yeah. And I think that, as you're saying, everyone is going to grieve differently. So giving each other space for that, but then also leaning into the marriage when it can be a source of comfort and consolation and steadiness. Um, I think rituals are really helpful, especially, you know, because then you kind of step into a role almost and um, it creates the space for everyone, the couple and the family, the relative, everybody to kind of have their own experience within that ritual. And talk um, about a ritual that you like, particularly for your family. You know, we had a couple of kind of spontaneous rituals in addition to the um, memorials and things like that. But the night that um, that Timmy went into surgery to have his organs taken for uh, organ transplant was a really dark night. 
literally a dark night. And we came back from the hospital in the middle of the night. Um, and it was just, just my husband and I had gone to the hospital and everyone else had stayed at our house. And when we came back to the house, they, the kids and our friends had candle lit the entire house. Mm. There was no you know, artificial light at all. It was all candlelight. And we just naturally all kind of gathered and we started chanting. Um, and we just kind of sat together for a couple of hours, praying, chanting, crying. Um, it was really, it was so beautiful and connected and people were moving in and out of the room as they needed to, but it was this frame that um, kind of held us all in this uh, beautiful light. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so kind of allowing things to arise spontaneously like that. Um, we did a six month celebration here on Kauai where Timmy had spent uh, his 13th year. Um, and at the time, six months later, it was really different than the rituals we did immediately after. So kind of taking stock of how's everybody feeling now at this time and pulling poems and readings that resonated then and just then going to the beach to do sort of a paddle out and a scattering of ashes. Um, so the, the rituals kind of help us find expression for what's going on if we can, can open up to that, right? Um, so I think that that, that that was also really helpful. Um, and the, the couple dynamic is critical because we're both kind of so much in pain and so much in need at the same time. So I need you to help me and meet my needs at the same time that you need so much help and support in maybe a completely different way. Um, so that can create some, you know, a severe disconnect. It can create some resentment of not being able to be present for each other. So maybe there are other people that can step in to be present, mm -hmm. whether it's um, family or friend or a counselor, but, but getting that support, you know, for mm -hmm. me, planning the rituals and being with people at, right after Timmy died was really helpful. It was soulful and it was deeply connected for Matt. He wanted solitude and silence. He was off in the upper room by himself while we were all at the dining table. It is very individual. So it was hard for me that he was so overwhelmed with sadness, but that's where he was. And so to try and pull him into a more extroverted kind of process, you know, he just couldn't do it. He was just in a deep, deep state of sadness. And for him, some of the things that really resonated were poems, readings, writing, music. Music has always been super powerful for him. So those were the kinds of things that consoled him and helped him drop in. Um, and I recognized that he wasn't going to be as available to me to really talk about grief because it was just there it was just overwhelming in a way, the sadness. So I I talked with my dear friends, with you know, other parents who had lost children that we were close with. Um, yeah, so it's a matter of, of uh, one, knowing, which is part of you know, the beauty of your program and your website is letting people know what to expect and that, yeah, it's gonna be really different. And for it's each hard. Person. And it's, it's gonna hard. be hard. It's there's hard. there's one thing that I wanted to say for sure, which is we had a conversation very early, maybe just a few days after Timmy died with our adult son and our adult daughter and Matt and myself, my husband and myself. Um, and we just sat down together and we took, a, we took the time to each just share how we were feeling in that moment. And both my son, who was Timmy's big brother and my husband felt such a sense of responsibility mm. as the father and as the big brother mm. of this child man. Um, that they somehow should have been able to protect him. Mm -hmm. And that was really helpful for them to put out there in words and for us to 
hear and support and help them release. So some of those, and again, it wasn't necessarily a ritual, but it was a kind of a structured conversation. And uh, so many feelings that um, maybe if we can give them voice, free us up a little bit, or at least inform this other intimate family how to best support you. Mm -hmm. um, I love how you all gave each other space to grieve in the way that, um, that you needed to. Was there ever a conversation? I don't think there was a conversation in those initial in that initial week of planning rituals. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like one, we needed to gather. And so that was happening. And then it was just an open space and people could move in and out of it. And so my husband chose to be mostly um, apart from that. But then he came to us, you know, several days into it and said, here's what I want to do as part of this memorial ritual. So he brought his piece but it wasn't in process with everyone else. It was like, okay, here's what I wanna do. And we incorporated that. Uh, and there was definitely tension at the table at times of how, how I wanna see this ritual move and I wanna take it in this direction. It was like, oh no, bring it back. <laughs> We're not going there. We're gonna come back here. But I think it was more powerful at the six month point actually with the family when we were looking at what are we gonna do for this scattering of ashes in six months. and. Um, you know, the, the tension of the grief being held within the family and um, my older son sort of saying, I don't know that I can, can be a part of this deep grief. You know, this is, this is like wearing on me to have so much grief held within the family, which was really important to hear and to be able to both tell him, well, you know, we're not letting you go. But, but we can also um, lighten up, you know, you don't have to bear our sadness. You're entitled to your own. I think one of the things that I, is really interesting in terms of how people process grief is prior griefs, because we had a couple of friends who, for whom it was very hard to be present with us, to even just physically be in the, the rituals, to be at the memorial. And um, a couple of these friends had lost both a woman friend and a man friend completely separate from each other. Both had lost their mothers at a very early age mm -hmm. and had not really been allowed to grieve, grieve because the fathers were trying to then hold the family together and, you know, stiff upper lip and carry on. Um, so it ended up being through Timmy's death and that process that they actually kind of dealt with that really early grief, but it, but it was hard for them and it took some time. Um, and then there was one other powerful piece, which was a young friend of Timmy's who was reluctant to come to the rituals, reluctant to come to the services. And, and I talked with him about it and he said, you know, I'm just afraid. I'm kind of just afraid to enter into this. And I said, well, of course you are. You and he were like peas in a pod. So if this can happen to him, you know, mm -hmm. it's gotta be really frightening. But I said, but what are you gonna, if you don't come to this, if you don't participate in grief at this time, mm -hmm. what's gonna happen the next time? You know, what's the pattern that you're setting for yourself about what you believe about grief? So, um, so we know that when, when we have a loss that these prior losses reverberate and how we move through one may be a pattern then of, of what at least our inclination is. But there's always then this opportunity, this invitation to maybe approach it a little differently. Right. Well, and let me fast forward now. Today, uh, it's been tw 12 years. It's his anniversary. It's been how many years that you've been married? 42. 42 years. Okay, where are you today? You know, I would say um, that this anniversary, I knew we were going to be talking this morning. So that's been a really important and helpful focus for me for this year. Each year as the anniversary approaches, I kind of try to just stay open to what it's gonna present and it's always different. Um, one, of the, one of the comments about writing this chapter in the book is when I was treating it more you know, minimally and not really delving into it, one of my readers said, you know, I would hate to think that you and Matt didn't survive Timmy's death, 
And I thought, well, it's 12 years later, of course we survived. But you know, it's an ongoing process individually and, and for the couple. So then I thought, well, you know, have we survived? <laughs> how, how are we doing with, with this grief? And, um, and I, think we, I think we have integrated uh, Timmy and Timmy's death, both his life and death into our lives. Um, for me, being able to finish the book and to include this powerful chapter, um, has been has been a really important part of that integration and uh yeah we're continuing to walk this uh journey together marriage is so much about growth just as our individual journey is so much about growth so when you when you overlay one individual journey on another guess what <laughs> it's gonna be rocky there are just gonna be times when it's really rocky and those may be times with a growth spurt of one person and the others pulling back or just disconnects. But so we have to expect that. And that's not something that our culture kind of teaches us to expect. So there are going to be rough times, but that, um, that that's, that that's normal and that that's okay. And that, that we can work through them. And if we can work through them, um, there is, there is so much then benefit and support of that long-term mm -hmm. marriage and that long-term look at one another um, so that, that the work is, is worthwhile. Um, yeah, so it's not magic, it's imperfectly ever after. And each marriage, I hope, is, is creative in you know, finding their own way uh, to allow the growth of each person. What I would say ultimately about Timmy's death and our marriage is that by our 30th year, we were in a place where our marriage held us. Mm, I love that. That Word. all the work we had done up to that point in time, that even if, if individually we were disconnected, that the marriage was large enough to really hold both of us in, um, yeah, in an embrace of support. Do you have a website that you want I to do? Tell us about? I have a website which is marriage marriage-unveiled.org, um, where you can order the book and uh, read more about um, the book, the marriage work, the divorce work, and continue the conversation because it's really right. about engaging each other in, in exactly this conversation. Thank you so much for being on the show today and for creating this beautiful book and giving us this wonderful story and hope for these marriages and again i want to say to you anybody who's watching this sherry and i have been through it and uh we have had long-term marriages so take heart and mm -hmm. have hope for your marriage and hang in there yes yeah. thank you so much yeah. sherry for your insight and your beautiful words thank you thank you both for your work and for uh inviting me i appreciate it and thanks everybody for joining us on the show today. And Rebecca and I want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.